Good morning. <laughs> it's good to see everyone. This message and this passage today is a little bit heavier, so I feel like I just need to laugh before I start, but I don't know how to do it. So how about you just look at the person next to you and say, it's going to be a hilarious morning. Just go ahead and say that. It's going to be a hilarious. <laughs> All right, let's bring it back in. <laughs> that was hilarious. It's good. Uh, now let's talk about loss. Uh, the older I get... The more I just keep experiencing loss. We, um, a couple weeks ago, I got this text message um, from my wife that was really sad. This is what it said. Something ate all our baby chickens with just tears coming down. Um, and she was. She was crying, I think, quite a bit when I talked to her on the phone after that. Uh, we've had chickens for like five or six years now, and every year we lose about one chicken. Um, and usually it's from a disease, like you walk in there one day and it's like, okay, we have a dead chicken. And it's not that heartbreaking usually. Usually they've lived for a little while. Um, sometimes they get this thing called egg binding, which is like they can't get rid of their egg, which we spent $2 on the chickens. We're not going to do like a $200 vet bill, you guys. We're just not going to do it. The chicken's going to die. I'm sorry. Uh, but ev okay. Every two to three years, we're like, oh, we need to get some more chickens, okay? So we went to the store this year. <laughs> we got a couple new baby chickens, uh, little chicks. And this is in March. We have two little kids, and, and they were picked them out. And um, we live in a pretty small house, and my wife works out of the house, and she's got this just kind of 10 by 10 office in a spare bedroom. And she had all the baby, you know, the baby chickens right next to her. For three months, she was taking care of them. She was feeding them. She was cleaning them. If you guys were around here during the construction this year, uh, every single week this room would get covered in dust because stuff would get torn out. That's kind of what her office was. Every single day it just gets covered in dust from the baby chickens. Um, so she just, she just put in all this work um, to raise up these little chickens. Now, if that sounds like a lot, it kind of is a lot. And that's why in the past, sometimes what we would do is we'd just buy adult chickens. You just go and buy an adult chicken and you kind of just skip that whole process. But the thing about buying the adult chickens is that you just don't feel that connection to those adult chickens. And so especially when they die, you're just like, yeah, whatever. I don't even remember what its name was. Like it was just, I bought it as an adult. Uh, but with this year was exciting because it was like, okay, you guys, we are going to get some babies. We're going to give them names. It's going to be cute. It's going to be great. And so something about that text message when I got it really like broke my heart. I was just like, you like had put in all this work and it was one, you know, they had finally made it outside. They finally made it out into kind of the caged protected area. But it was the first time we ever had a predator come in and, and it was like a massacre, I think. I, I didn't see it, but that's, I heard stories afterwards and it sounds like it was pretty bad. And so something uh, got in there. And so kind of just that, that idea of the fact that these chickens never really had an ability to live a full life. You know, they just had this very shortened life. So something about that was just really sad. It, that in a moment, all of this potential for life could just be taken away. It was really sad. And I bring up the, the loss of something kind of insignificant like chickens because it's a lot easier to talk about something like that than it is to talk about the very real and devastating and normal parts of our world where we lose someone or we lose something. And, and it's those more serious losses that we face with the people in our lives or the relationships in our lives uh, or the friendships that are irreversibly broken. Th those are the things that are really, really, really hurt. They're, they're hard to talk about. And, and it's times, I've, a couple times, unfortunately, I've had a couple old soccer friends of mine from growing up. You get a call and you find out, they passed away just suddenly. They're, they're gone, and you can't turn back the clock. It's a couple of my relatives when they were young, same thing. It's just you get the call, and all of a sudden, it's gone. You know, there's nothing you can do about it. Or it's, it's, sometimes it's not even with a life, but it's, it's with a relationship. I have a friend who called me about a year ago, and he started to, to explain to me what's really going on in his marriage. And now it's been a year of things just kind of dissolving and falling apart, and it's this huge loss and so sometimes it's these really big things. Sometimes it's a lot smaller things. Sometimes it's just the home that we grew up in. You know, our parents tried their best. We, some of us, our parents in here, we all try our best. But sometimes we just didn't get what we needed, right? It's nobody's fault. We just didn't get what we needed. Or we faced trauma in like small ways that just kind of eroded us, our personality over the years, and turned us into a different person. And so we have... Um, 
different forms of hurt that, that we have in our lives, and now we have to live with the repercussions of those. And it feels like we have to live this big, daunting life sometimes from the big hurts and the small hurts in our life. And then you look at the chickens, and you're like, it's not really that big of a deal in comparison to some of the other things that we face. And so just for a moment, I just want you to look around at the people around you, and I just want you to recognize that every single person in this room carries something like that with them all the time. For some people, they're carrying it right now. It's like out in the forefront of their mind. For some people, you don't want to think about it. It was like a long time ago, and you try not to think about it. Um, but this is a personal thing. It's, it's for everybody who's here. We're not talking about someone else out there. It, we're talking about people in here. Each of us have stories of profound loss. And yet, look at you. You're here. It's July 28th, and you made it. Isn't that amazing? You are still here, and you are still worshiping God. And, and so if each of us are willing to be honest, though, about our experience, we, we would want to admit that at some point in our lives, we have uttered these words. Where were you, Jesus? Where were you? When we're facing profound loss and hardship in our life, we ask that question. And especially as we travel, we've been traveling through the book of John in this series, we've been discovering who Jesus is. And as we have, we've learned that he is life, and he is light, and he's truth, but most noticeably from the past couple of weeks, we've actually been discovering that Jesus is himself God. He's claimed to be God. Last week, if you were here in John chapter 10, Jesus claimed to be God in front of the religious authorities, uh, in front of the leaders, and they tried to kill him because he claimed to be God. Um, and so this week, we're going into John chapter 11. So if you're not already there, go ahead and open up to John chapter 11. We are going to be digging through a lot of the chapter. I will tell you this right now, I am not going to read it. It's 57 verses long. Um, Brian came up with that schedule, and he said, 57 verses, Nate, preach on it. And I said, I will not. And so uh, I will preach on some of it. We will go to, I'm joking, we did not have that conversation. Um, we're going to go through the story, um, and we're not going to read the whole thing. But it starts, it's set up in John chapter 10. So John 10, Jesus is in Jerusalem at the temple, and he is there during the Hanukkah festival, and he is quite clear with the Pharisees and the priests that he is God's uniquely set-apart son. He is the unique son of God, and he's even able to evade the grasp then of these people. As he leaves, they try to kill him, and he leaves and he retreats and he goes eastward and he goes over the Jordan River to a place where um, it's a lot cooler, tensions that people aren't trying to kill him there. And so he goes over the river back to the place uh, where John the Baptist was baptizing people. And it says that while he's there, people are listening to him and hearing him and people are coming to know him and to follow him while he is there. And so it's while he's there on the other side of the Jordan River that he gets a message from Mary and Martha. Now, these are friends of his uh, that we read about in the Gospels, like personal friends of his. They're not his disciples. They're just friends, like someone you would call up or someone you would spend time with. Two sisters, they're followers of Jesus. They send word to Jesus about their brother, Lazarus, who is also one of Jesus' best friends, who is sick and possibly dying and so verse 3 of John chapter 11 describes the message that they send to Jesus. It says, Lord, the one that you love is sick. And I want us to catch the way that Jesus responds right from the start, because the way he responds tells us everything we need to know about the rest of the passage. He says this. He says in verse 4, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that the God's son might be glorified through it. And so the first thing I want us to pick up this morning is really, really simple. It's this. It's that Jesus already knows. Jesus already knows the circumstance going on with, with Lazarus. Jesus already knows what's happening. I don't think he needed a message even from them. He already knew what the situation was. Now, sickness in our day is bad. We are in a community with a lot of medical uh, professionals who are in the room right now. It's just the kind of community that we live in. Uh, sickness is a huge industry in our modern world, and it's really bad. Most of us have been touched by sickness, or we have somebody we know who has died from a disease or something terrible. 
But sickness in the first century was terrible. Sickness was really bad because they simply didn't understand how sickness worked the way that we do today. So remember just the idea that there are these little things called germs that you can't see and that they carry sicknesses, that wasn't even an idea until the 19th century, and, and it was just a theory when it was presented. And so not only did they have a kind of distorted view of sickness or just an incomplete view of sickness, but they had no way of treating so many diseases. They just didn't have a way to treat this stuff, which is why their age of mortality was so low. So sometimes you'd get a person who might make it to a ripe old age. They'd live like a full life, but more often than not, you get some bad sickness in your 30s or your 40s or, or even younger than that, and, and you could die. And that's what's going on with Lazarus is he has some sickness that's going on. And so sickness often led to death. Today we think like take a pill, take a medication, you're healed. It's not that easy. Sickness and death were this like closely related thing. And sickness was often also related to sin. If you guys remember the story in the Gospels of when there's a person who is born blind, you remember the question they ask about him? They say, who sinned? Did his parents sin or something? It just shows you the mentality of how they thought about it, is that sin leads to sickness, leads to death. They're all just kind of related to one another. And so there's times when people had a physical malady, but it really had more to do with sin and sickness and death. It all kind of gets wrapped up under the same umbrella. And it's why Paul uses the, idea, uh, uses the idea in his writings when he talks about the wages of sin being death. That when you sin, it will ultimately lead you towards death. It's a logical process of how our world works. And Jesus sees it. Jesus knows it. Jesus is not surprised. Jesus is not even really that phased by it. You guys keep noticing how in the book of John, Jesus is just not really phased by much of anything? It's kind of incredible. It, it says this in verse six, 6. It says that when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. That's a very weird thing to do. Isn't that strange? You think about your best friend. Again, this is hard for us to imagine. We always think of ourselves maybe as being in the disciples' shoes, those are like his friends, obviously, but they're also people who are a part of his inner core that's following him. Think about just being Jesus' friend, who Jesus might come and see when he's in town. Now, if your friend gave you a message about them being sick, wouldn't you respond to that? We have a close relative who has a sickness, a really bad sickness, that it's a terminal illness that he's suffering from. And we, and we heard in May that he might be getting worse. And so the first thing that we did is that we just planned immediately. We're heading up there. As soon as the kids are done with school in June, we're heading up for a week and we're spending time with him. Because that's what you do when you hear about a sickness like this. And yet Jesus understood Lazarus's condition better than anyone. He, he completely understood the condition. And yet his response is this like seemingly cold, distant, response. He's unconcerned. And so after two days of no movement from Jesus, he finally gets up. He finally tells his disciples, come on, come follow me back to Judea, right back to Bethany, where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived, right back into the fires of Judea. People want to kill him in Judea, where the religious leaders had just finished with an attempt on his life, and his disciples bring it up. They're like, well, well, wait a minute, Jesus. You might get killed if you go back to Judea. And they say, uh, in verse 8, they say, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going to head back in there? So Jesus is kind of pulled in two directions here. He first waits a little bit of time. Then he finally decides, okay, we'll go there and do something. But then his disciples are kind of like, are you actually going to do that? And yet Jesus, in his very Jesus kind of way, has to clarify exactly who he is and what he's doing and clarify, clarify that he knows exactly what's happening and that exactly what he's doing and exactly why he's going to do what he's going to do, exactly when he's going to do it. He just knows the whole timeline and he has a plan in place. He says, listen, I'm the light of the world and as long as you're with me, you walk 
in the light. The way he says it is interesting. He says, listen, there's, aren't there 12 hours of daylight in a day? And if you walk in the daylight, you'll be fine. In other words, they're worried about Jesus getting killed, and yet Jesus reminds them that his death will only happen when he willingly lays his own life down. It'll happen exactly when he wants it to happen. In fact, in John chapter 10, just one chapter before this, he said exactly that. He said, nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and to take it up again. And so it's this reminder from Jesus in this new way to simply say to his followers, why are you so wrapped up in concerns about being consumed by sin and by plots and by threats of death and by disease? Don't you realize who it is that travels with you? Friends, it's something for us to remember this morning. You realize who it is you carry with you? Every moment of every day, you carry the light of the world with you. Everywhere you go, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit that you carry God with you. And Jesus says, you don't think I know what I'm doing? You don't think I know where I'm going? And so for us, it's that same question, that in your life, when your reality intersects with sin, your own sin, someone else's sin around you, or with death, there's death around you, or brokenness, just brokenness that's happening in the world around you, how do you respond to that? Are you phased by it? It's human. It's normal to be phased by it. It's normal to struggle with that. But I want you to hold that tension as we move through the story because even though it's totally normal to respond in a totally normal human way to the brokenness in our world, I want you to consider that perhaps Jesus already knows about whatever pain it is that arises in your life. Do you ever think that, man, he already knows what I'm going through? And so Jesus is distinctly aware of what's going on with Lazarus. And he's distinctly aware of the threat on his life and going back into Judea. And he's distinctly aware because he's intimately familiar with the brokenness of our world, but also with the holiness in our world. We live in, in, in a, holy light, a holy world, but also in a broken world. He knows that our world is simultaneously both of these things and so that's the second thing that I want us to pick up on this morning, that living in our world is a constant tension between life and death. Every single day of our life is a tension between these two things. And we're so often dismayed with the fact that God would allow so much beauty, but also so much pain. And we see that dynamic expressed through Mary and Martha. As they meet Jesus uh, near their hometown of Bethany, it says that by the time Jesus finally got to Bethany, Lazarus had been dead four days. So that means that Lazarus must have died pretty quick, if you do the math. They must have sent a message, and right after they sent the message, Lazarus probably died. And so I want you to imagine being best friends with Jesus and communicating clearly this problem to him and knowing that he alone has the power to fix it, and instead of him rushing to fix it, he waits and he sits and he pauses, and he allows his best friend to die. Can you imagine? And Martha has the boldness to say what I think all of us have said in our hearts before to God, but we don't like to admit it. It's, Jesus, where are you? Where were you? God, where were you? Verse 21, she says, if you had been here my brother would not have died. Flat out, she says it. I mean, I thought we just got done learning that Jesus is God, which means that Jesus should seemingly have no limits, and yet, where was he when I needed him most? It's such a blunt statement. And, and I mean, she, she affirms, she knows this. She says, even now, I know that whatever you ask for, you can do. You know, she says, I know, I know who you are. I know what you're capable. Anything you ask for, you're going to be able to do it. But man, you could have been here four days ago, and we wouldn't have had to go through any of this in the first place. And so Martha's frustration isn't just a frustration with Jesus. 
It's her frustration with God. She's frustrated with God. It's that fundamental frustration that all of us have to face and deal with in some way and at some time. I mean, it's when we open up Genesis chapters 2 and 3. We're reading chapter 1 and everything's going great. And then we're like, no, don't put the tree there. Why would you put the tree in the garden? Why did you even set up the world to be this way in the first place? It doesn't make any sense. It's to say, God, why did you create our reality in which there was this potential for sin and brokenness and death in the first place? It doesn't make any sense to me, God. Why is life fundamentally so broken? You know, I was reminded of this a few years ago when that same friend of mine who was diagnosed with a terminal illness, he got his diagnosis And in the weeks and the months uh, that came after that, we had a lot of conversations about death. We still do. Uh, Unpacking just the idea of death and that death is this imminent thing for him. Uh, But the mistake that we have so often in our world is that we only speak about this stuff when death is clearly imminent. We don't like to talk about this stuff, which I totally understand. In our culture, we, we, we like to polish everything. We don't want to talk about any of this stuff. But I told him in one of our conversations, I I said, you know, life is 100% fatal. (laughs) It will take you in the end. There will be an end to your life. Each of us is born into this world with a 100% chance of it coming to an end someday. And it's so painfully obvious, it's kind of funny, but we spend so much of our lives voiding it and masking it that it's not until a close friend or like a family member, or a parent passes away, that we're faced with it. We're forced to face it head on. And we finally say to God, I don't get it. I just don't get why you made the world this way. I don't understand why you didn't just fix the problem of sin and death in the first place. And I want us to see this clearly, because our lives kind of sit on the precipice of two chasms, one of which is life and death on either side. It's like we can always choose to go towards life or we can choose to go towards death. And I think that God intentionally structured our lives this way because of who he is. And as we've been reading through John, we've been discovering it. Who is he? Well, Jesus shows us that God is love and that God is life. It's who God is that God is love and he's life. We've been working our way through and seeing again and again that just life keeps flowing out of Jesus and that Jesus keeps showing us what love looks like. And because love is inherently non-coercive, in other words, it'll never force you to love back. Love will never force you to love back, but it always will allow you the room to say no. No to love. And because it's that way, it makes all the sense in the world that our world is full of life and love emanating everywhere from God, but that it is also full of the repercussions of when we say no to that love. In other words, to live within God's world is to always have the option to choose love and to always have the option to deny it. And the trajectory of our life is the repercussion of that choice. That's, that's the direction of your life, whether you choose to love or you choose to deny God's love. And the beautiful and the astounding thing is not so much just that God has created this reality of that option to love, but it's how he ultimately chose to fix the problem, the problem of the brokenness in me and in you, the brokenness in his world, because he chose to fix it in a very specific way. He chose to fix it by sending his son who is love. And this is where we as humans can get tripped up because when we finally recognize who Jesus is, as we have been doing in the book of John, and he, that he came incarnate onto our earth, we think, finally, God's here. God's going to fix all the problems in our world. He's going to magically do away with all the problems in the world. But the reality of who God is shows us that, yes, he will one day finish the job and eliminate sin and death forever, But his job in the person of Jesus was to conquer sin and death and to give us the ability to connect with God again. But there's a problem with that. If Jesus was going to conquer sin and death, the problem is where it lives. Where does sin and death live? Right here. 
in each and every one of us. And so the problem is, how does God get rid of sin and death without getting rid of the people he so dearly loves? How does he eliminate it without eliminating me and you? And that is the key to understanding why Jesus does what he does and why the plan is the way that it is, and why he acts the way that he is, and why he's so unconcerned with things like his friend dying, seemingly. It's because he has a completely different plan and a completely different vision of the world. It's because he knows that plan. He knows that there is a way to destroy sin and death once and for all, and he can do it without destroying each of us. And he is on his way to doing it. And he knows that when he gets to the cross, it's going to be this clear demonstration of a God who would come down and love us. And not just say, I love you, but he would die on our behalf to show you his deep love. His death on the cross would open a pathway back for you so you can connect with God again, so that God can come and live inside of you again. It's open to you. And Jesus clearly shows that it's open to each of us when he talks to Martha and he tells her that Lazarus will rise again. Now, Martha's response is this kind of esoteric and theological. It's something you'd hear in a sermon, to be blunt. She says, oh yeah, I know, he will rise again at the resurrection someday. Have you ever been mourning uh, after the death of a friend or a loved one? And, and, And I've done this before, mistakenly, but somebody comes up and puts their arm around you and say, they're in a better place. Or they say, one day you'll see them again in heaven. And it's well-intentioned stuff. It's not that it's not, un- it's not true. It is true. It's just that it's not enough in that moment. It's not enough. It doesn't fix the problem of the fact that I am drowning in the dark reality of this pain right here and right now. And so I love the way that Jesus responds to her because he doesn't disagree with her. He, he- thinking, yeah, you will see her someday in the resurrection, or you will see Lazarus one day in the resurrection. But he wants to make absolutely clear for her what is actually true. He says, Martha, you're talking about resurrection? Listen, I am the resurrection and the life. You don't need to talk about some idea of someday a resurrection coming. You don't need to to wish about someday when there'll be an eternal life. I'm standing right here. Our world is full of sin and death and life and love, but in Jesus, there is no mixing of those things. It's all life. It is all resurrection life flowing through Jesus. And so Jesus is saying, you're talking about some day far off in the future? Look at the man standing right in front of you. I am the resurrection and the life. It's me. There's no death with me. I am fully life. In fact, the The Apostle Paul says this. He says in Colossians chapter 1, he says that it's Christ who is the life force that is holding everything together in our universe. That is who Christ is. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asks you a question. He says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Puts a whole new spin on how you view life and death, doesn't it? And the way you view life and death, that transforms and influences your whole world. It's the way you see your whole world. Uh, Death, because it's this ever-looming reality for us. It's like a dark cloud out in the horizon. You can kind of ignore it for as long as you want, but someday you will have to face it. And for those of us who try to keep in shape or eat the right way to kind of prolong our life, It only works for a little while. It's a great thing to do, but even for those of us who do that, death will still face us. So we don't just need blind optimism. We don't need paranoia. We don't just need a better diet. What we need is somebody who has life flowing out of them, who is true divine life, who is able to do something about it. Amen? That's what we need. We need somebody who can do something about it. And that is exactly who Jesus is. The author of the book of Hebrews puts it this way. It says that Jesus shared in our humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. 
and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. That's what Jesus came to do. You see, it was right of Mary and Martha to be upset with him, to be upset about the fact that Jesus could have came, he could have kept Lazarus alive. I think it was right of them to feel that way. But I think there's something intentional that God is doing by being incarnate, by allowing us to sit in the pain of death and loss. And I don't think he does it randomly or haphazardly. And so why does he do it? Why does he do it? Well, verse 4 tells you why to do it. It says that it's through this death God's glory might be shown. And you say, well, how can glory be shown through something as painful as death? Well, read on. And I I'd encourage you to, to look in your Bible if you have it. I'm going to read verses 32 to 35. It says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet and she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit. That word deeply moved in his spirit is almost, he, he was almost angry. He, that's how moved he was. He was sad, he was heartbroken, but he's almost angry, he was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? He asked, come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Jesus wept. You know, each of us this morning brings in a lot of ideas about who God is everywhere we go. You bring your ideas about who God is with you, about God saving, about God judging, about God making things right. My question is, do you carry with you in your daily life this reality that God weeps with you? Do you carry that with you in your daily life? Because it's one thing for God to be the almighty fixer of the world, but how often do we not need something fixed, but we just need someone who will simply sit and deeply feel with us? Just feel what we are feeling in the moment, in the rawness. Uh, the way my friend Jill puts it, this, this week we were meeting and talking about this passage together and prepping for this, this morning. She said, Jesus wants us to feel the pain of the world, wants to feel the pain of the world with us. Then we'll know. We're not alone. Jesus wants us to know that we're not alone. It's an encouragement to know that Jesus is not asking us to go through any pain that he himself is not willing to go through. He's there and he weeps with us and he understands the difficulties of our life of pain and death, but he's willing to sacrifice his own life so that we would know that we're never alone. And so it shows us a third image this morning of who Jesus is that he mourns, and yet he takes action in our life. He mourns with us, but then he takes action in our life. And this is, for me, really powerful, because it's a, it's, it's a lived reality in my life. Uh, as far back as I can remember, to the time that I was a young child, my inner world felt quite broken in, in many ways, and for reasons that are really complicated and, and diverse, um, I had to learn how to exist within a really chaotic and scary world. And so as, as an adult, I look back and I think, this was not anyone's fault, really. I think we just live in a broken world. And I saw broken people around me, and I look at my own brokenness that's, that's apparent in my life. But as an adult now, I look back and I see how I developed just a constant state of, to put it in simple modern terms, anxiety, just constantly churning away inside of, inside of me. And so life never felt comfortable, and so I started reaching out towards peace wherever I could find it. So peace when I'd go to camp. I could feel the peace of God, or peace that I would experience through music and art. Every time I play an instrument, it's like the anxiety just kind of leaves. Or peace that I found through sports or working out or through relationships that I had. But as I've processed more and more of my life over the years, I've been able to ask this question of God, and I ask him it often when I am on walks with him, I've been able to simply say, it's been years of the same stupid anxiety stuff that's churning away. When are you going to do something about it? You ever ask those questions of God? When are you going to actually fix the problem? I was sitting with Brian last week, we were, or two weeks ago, we were talking about this passage. I said, I brought that up with him. I just said, don't you think he'd fix it by now? 
And I remember something changing in my perspective more recently, just in the past year, because I just didn't see the point of it. But now when I start to live through it, I'm starting to realize that Jesus wants to meet me right there. Because every time I feel overwhelmed, my first inclination is to go to him. And so in a strange, odd way, the worst things in my life have driven me towards him. And I meet him there. And I see not just that he wept, but that he's still weeping with me every single moment of every single day. We, we think of weeping as a sign of weakness, but think about it. The all-powerful God of the universe chose to willingly come down and sit with you in the dirt, in the brokenness. This is such a powerful statement, and it's actually in the sharing of weakness that true transformation, that true resurrection can happen. And that's where we're heading with this story. That's where change takes place. I love the way that uh, one of the great Catholic thinkers of the 20th century, Henry Nouwen, puts it. Hear this uh, quote. He says, Often it's the dark forest that makes us speak about the open field. Frequently prison makes us think about freedom. Hunger helps us to appreciate food. And war gives us words for peace. Often our visions of the future are born out of our own despair. Only a few happy endings actually make us happy. But rather, someone's careful and honest articulation of the ambiguities, the uncertainties, and the painful conditions of life give us new hope. The paradox is indeed that new life is born out of the pains of the old. And if you don't read Henry Nouwen, you need to do that immediately because he's the best writer of the 20th century. And so Jesus, I believe, wants us to see and experience two things as we close here. That life is on the one hand an experience of pain and sin and death, and on the other hand, he will meet us and sit right there with us in the middle of it, and that he will take us out of it and through to transformation and resurrection. And someday in the future when he renews all things, but especially right now for those of us who follow him, Jesus says we will never have to taste the bitterness of death. And so to prove it, he resurrected a four-day dead man who stunk like death. Can you imagine the terrible smell? I mean, they mentioned the terrible smell in the passage. He, he resurrected a four-day dead man to show us that resurrection will always conquer death. It will always conquer death. There is no death that Jesus' resurrection will not cancel out. It will always win. And so to end today, I simply want to ask you the question, what part of your life stinks like death? You can nervously laugh if you want to. There's some part of your life that stinks like death. Jesus actually allowed for his friend to die in order for God's glory to be shown in his life. And I wonder if there's some part of your life this morning that God is simply asking you to let go of. For me, I really hate what he's been asking me to let go of. It's been the past like two or three months. I've been writing music my whole life, and I have hundreds of ideas and songs and things saved, and I, f I keep him asking me, hearing him to tell me to get rid of all the old stuff because he wants to do something new in my life through this thing that I have in my life, and I'm like, I don't want to do it. And so my question for you is what is it for you? It could be something simple. It could be something really big that God is just simply asking you, let go of it. Let it die. See what kind of new life I'm going to bring out of you if you allow this part of you to die. And that's the invitation for us this morning, and that is what I'm going to pray for us for this morning. So would you pray, for, uh, pray with me? God, we are thankful for what you did in and through your friend Lazarus. It's incredible to think that it took uh, his death in order for you uh, uh, to show us just the way that uh, you wanted to show transformation and resurrection and change in our world. But God, I pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts this morning to recognize the transformation that's possible if we allow you to work in our lives. And so there's barriers, Lord, there's walls in our lives that we are willingly holding up to you this morning. We're saying, change it. 
We're saying, take it. Make me something new. God, I pray that you'd bring those things to mind as we go throughout the day. God, I pray that um, this morning as people leave, that there'd be just a sense of even optimism that we would look at the future of what it is you're leading us into and that we would be willingly uh, following you there. And so we pray for everything that you're going to do in our lives, and we thank you in advance, Lord. We say amen.